Welcome back. This is the second half of our newspaper review on K24 this morning. Of course, we're looking at um, the big story right now, which is the reopening of learning institutions. As uh, children head back to school, what are the concerns the children have, the parents have, the teachers as well, and all stakeholders involved in this particular process? Uh, join the conversation with me uh, in studio, CAS Ministry of Education, Zach Inovia. Join the conversation uh, via uh, Skype is Peter Ndoro. He is the CEO of the Kenya Private Schools Association. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Of course, even as we continue this particular discussion. Zach, I'll come back to you because even as you speak about the whole social distancing issue and the mm -hmm. building of schools, mm -hmm. there's the whole infrastructural audits that I think mm -hmm. was, was directed to be done in September 2013, mm -hmm. 2019, mm -hmm. um, after the collapse of Precious Talent. Mm -hmm. And we thought the government would go around uh, the country, assess where we stand infrastructural-wise, and luckily, that would have helped us uh, go, I mean, just jump so many hurdles by the time COVID-19 came. Did we ever finish that? What yeah, was the yeah, status yeah. of that then? Yeah, yeah, Jeff, there was a, an inspection uh, report assessing especially private institutions. Mm -hmm. Because that, that pressure was a private, private institution. institution. And most of them were found wanting. The quality uh, assurance director, quality assurance director in the ministry, uh, Madam, Madam uh, Dr. Agaturu, mm -hmm. has a report about the schools that they permanently closed down, about the schools they properly advised on upgrade, and on schools they advised on the mode to continue operating. That one is on private schools. That, that, that's private. It can be sanctioned. On public schools, it would be very interesting for you to learn that we still have spaces in the rural settings. All the schools in the rural area have space. It is not an emergency. Adding classes there would not help. Because the classes that are already there are not full to capacity, yet others have been closed. The school I went to, for, for instance, in, in, in my area, we used to be 700 or 800. These days there are three or 400. Those classes are still there, stand, standing majestic. Nobody to use them, because it is true Kenudia left the village for Nairobi, and his children will not go to the village to learn. They will learn here in the city. So the urban and peri-urban areas are the ones that are strained. Government schools within even those two areas of urban and peri-urban still have space. And that is why when that school collapsed, we were able to place those children within five kilometers radius in government school, like Jamhuri. And still, it is not full. Mm -hmm. When we talk about this congestion, I am asking Kenyans with the utmost respect to always pause and ask, is this private or is it public? Because if it is public, then the government takes responsibility. Mm -hmm. If it is not public, the government moves in and secure the interest of the people, the interest of the children, the interest of the nation in those schools. It is not about every time beating drums of criticism. It is about also telling the government here, Mr. Government, you are wrong because instead of A, you should have used B strategy. And we will listen. People should not say government don't listen. We listen. And we are responsive. So in terms of infrastructure audit, we said what we foresee as a crisis is 2023. 2023 has always been mark, mapped as a crisis year if we don't do anything now. And that is why I have told you we are doing something. Mm -hmm. 7.3 billion shillings is going to be injected in infrastructure alone. Desks, a class and a and desk will be constructed. Laboratory that is equipped will be constructed. Ablution blocks will be expanded. These are so many in 30 counties in this country that are hard-pressed. And this is in preparation of the transition from CBC, or rather from 844 to CBC. to CBC, because the first class will be in 2023, junior mm -hmm. secondary. Right. The first class will be 23. So we are preparing now. After that, all the CDF money has been asked to task in upgrading day school secondary, day secondary schools. Because this transition from class 8, as, as we move into CBC fully, this transition from class 8, every child will go to school. Because there are, for example, say 1.8 million pupils all of them will go to a secondary school. So, because in the past only 30% would make it and others would fizzle, now these 70% that is remaining, where are they going? This is why we are saying 
we have done our audit as government and we are investing in classes, we are investing in laboratories, we are investing in ablution blocks, we are investing in workshops. We are investing in everything that shall keep our children in school. In day school, that is where the catch is. In boarding schools, the money continues to be, uh, to be sent by the government to continue expanding as per the size. Okay. The big schools. Let me get uh, Mr. Ndoro in on this conversation as well. And Peter, I want to take off uh, your hat as CEO of uh, the Kenya Private Schools Association because as we started this uh, show this morning, you are sitting next to Mark, your son. As a parent, <laughs> what's your biggest concern on day one of this particular process as uh, Mark goes back to Kabarak Primary? Why he's sitting with the son? The son should be in school. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Peter, if you can hear me. Okay, a bit of a technical hitch there. We'll get Peter back on that. Yeah, but it is important point. to say, uh, while uh, Peter organizes uh, uh, his end, it is illegal for him to be with his son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if that son is of school-going age, the son should be in school. Yes, but there's a, there's a bit of time. It's barely even nine, uh, Bonazak. No, no, but, but, but school should report between, this is opening between, day. between seven to nine. Uh -huh. So every child should be in school now. So probably it's 10 minutes away. No, no, no. no. He's sitting with him on TV. I think it is important as government to sanction him. We'll answer that question once. Yeah, let him answer. Because you can't he, see him anymore. He so should probably be, oh, Mark oh, has, he has, he has uh, run away from government. Probably. Yeah. You'll find that out. But also, um, Zach, let me come to you with the question of... Uh, you, you said the ministry deals with yes. uh, public schools. Yes. But also, there's the plight of the private schools as well. And mm -hmm. ask uh, Peter mm -hmm. this question mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, 2020, very many private schools closed mm -hmm. down uh, mm -hmm. because of and the tough economic times that mm. were there. Mm. We're getting into this particular year. Yes. And now the ministry's directive is that for those candidates who are in private schools, mm. if the school has been shut down, get a public school yes. where you can sit. Yes. What does that mean to the private school that has shut down? Nothing happens to them, we, we move on? There are two ways, and I thank you for that question. The plight of private schools have two f with, uh, prongs. The first prong is the prong of the kids and the students, because they are both secondary and primary uh, private schools. For, 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 for the part of the students, which is what is very key and important, we have said through the resolutions that we passed yesterday that all the kids who were in schools that have closed shall be placed in public schools. And when I say shall, it is a continuous process. They have been traced and they are being placed now. It is a trace and place, mm -hmm. trace and place strategy. Now, they are being placed, they have been traced. So, as far as our kids are concerned, our learners, they are in order and they have been secured. There's another thing. There are children who are in private schools who may not be able to report back even if those schools are there because their economic fortunes for their parents and guardians have dwindled, mm -hmm. completely dwindled. So now, the question is, how do we deal with these students? We have said these people must go to schools so they can afford public schools and there are spaces for them. So as far as kids are concerned, it's okay. Now, for, as he mentioned, I think when I was coming in, there has also been a question of what about the entrepreneurs, educational entrepreneurs who have fallen victim of bad economic times? How do we help them? There has been ongoing discussion, as you know, that proponents thought through the registered private schools, they would get a soft loan of 7 billion shillings from government to help them resuscitate their institution. And that discussion was brought to the Ministry of Education, was shared to the Ministry of uh, uh, Treasury, was shared to the Ministry of, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, to the Head of Public Service, and also, very importantly, the President was well aware of this matter. Now, the idea is it was never abandoned. But as you know, there has not been much income coming in because when the citizens are strained, the government is strained as much because now we have no tax. We have no revenue to collect enough, even for our own. Can I tell you, mm -hmm. out of 19 billion, we have been able, under very difficult circumstances, to secure money to send to secondary school and primary school. We have sent for primary schools, 4 billion, 6, and we will send for secondary school before the end of this week or beginning of the next and it has been very tough. So, to say that I foresee the government bailing them out, I am not sure, because the problem is not the idea, the problem is the resources. Mm -hmm. If banks can hear us and step in and give these entrepreneurs, in educational entrepreneurs, to revive their schools, it is highly 
encouraged. Okay. Mm. Uh, let's look at um, what we might have moving forward past this first couple of weeks. Yes. And as even students get back into the rhythm of school, mm -hmm. because we're having what uh, might be a crash course of sorts to try and make sure by 2023 we're back on track after mm -hmm. the two years mm -hmm. of trying to rejig mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And some people are looking at the plan and calling it, um, we are planning this for the examination instead of learning. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it have been possible to probably change the syllabus so that the students don't have to do all they should have done in such a you know squeezed amount of time mm -hmm. and pick what's important and mm -hmm. then from there give them more space also to enjoy the learning process because it seems like from mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. for the next two years if mm -hmm. you're in school mm -hmm. it's a real crash course for mm -hmm. you as a student mm -hmm. in primary or secondary mm -hmm. the, de the the design for 844 completes and is never complete without an exam that is why we moved from it because it made our children examination oriented citizens and a results-oriented student instead of content and ideas-oriented student. This is why we, we wrote off 844. And because it was a burden, we must move with the burden to the composite pit. We are moving to it. I have told you the, the last class will be 22. Those who will sit uh, KCPE. Actually, it's next year. So yeah. once we are through with that class, and that's why we are doing marathon, our children will never have to feel the burden of examination will never have to feel the burden of studying to pass. They will never feel that burden. So while it lasts, we must do it. Our people in the mountain, where I'm born and bred, have a, have a very indigenous proverb that say, when you're carry, carrying a load, it gets heavier as you get to where it is going, in the store, in the silo, Ikobe, that's what they say. Mm -hmm. It gets heavier, and this is why it is heavy. But now we are saying we want to restore by plowing back time the nine months that we lost, there are about 25 academic weeks. Beginning now, all the classes except from form four and class eight, by the way, good news is that form four are doing exams in, in the next two months. Class eight are doing in the next two months. And then we transit them. They will begin their first term in July, those who are in class eight. And then we will have stabilized uh, this thing so that by 2023, this is January, Jeff. You and I in January always opened in Form 1, or rather Term 1, whether in primary or secondary. This was Term 1. It is not so. Now it is Term 2 to those who opened today, and it is Term 3 to exam class. This discordant, uh, uh, for, for, uh, rather this discordant is what we want to correct going forward. So please let the pain be felt because the end is for their own good. Right. So. Yeah. For some people, it might feel like for, for those who are candidates now, those who are in 844 now, they're paying the price for a better future for their younger brothers and sisters. Is, is that where we you are? Have, you have put it better. So that's how things are. This, are this is how it is, and we must tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. they let them pay the price, even for their own good, because we have to transit them. We had the option of saying, begin where we started, mm -hmm. and you'll do your exam in October. And that was the option I actually supported. But I was overridden by the vote uh, within uh, our stakeholders' meeting. Many people felt, ah, write it off. Uh, after all, we had only gone to school for two months, January, February. But they said, no, psychologically it has an effect in our kids. Let us seem to be uh, cognizant of the fact that they feel deserted, they feel uh, lost, they feel hopeless. Inject some hope in it, and that's what we did. Okay. And I'm very proud to say that our candidates are extremely hopeful to do their exams, and I wish them the very best. Those who wanted to go to national schools, extra county and county, they will. Those who wanted to go to the university and TVET, they will. But the most important thing is that our candidates are back on track of hope and on track of inspirational success that they all looked for in the last eight years and in the last 12 Yes. Okay. Um, this might be water under the bridge because we're way past that and they're now getting ready for the examination. Yes, yes. But also because you were in the meeting as this was discussed, yes. some people are wondering why the rush and fast to try and force them back to school to finish all of this because if you're sitting for class 8 exams, yes. there's been seven years of learning. Yes. If you're form 4 candidate, there's been three years of learning prior mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Is that last year everything that if you don't do that, you aren't in secondary school or you aren't in primary school? Surely those seven years of learning count for something. You can to test us, that yes. and take you to secondary to, us as to a, university. To us as a government, that, was, uh, that, that one was to surface, to us. But to children who are our greatest stakeholder in the education sector, they said it means everything to us. Do everything. And they actually said, even if, even if it means give us examination for what you have learned, give us. 
Even if it means test us on what we have learned, give us. They, they, they wanted nothing less. But now you see now, as I told you earlier, a wholesome student under the program of 844 system must go through certain uh, criteria to be declared competent so that we don't also churn out half-baked people. That is what is learned in every level. Missing the level, the last level, is actually more dangerous because heavy content and most important relevant content is towards the last two. That is class 7 and 8 and the last form 3 and 4. That is where heavy content and that's what defines the career for students. Because if you want to be a doctor, it is shaped in form 3 because that's when you now decide biology and chemistry. So if we do not give you the last year, four year, the study and the curriculum set, you will not be wholesome. You will be a half-baked doctor, you will be a half-baked engineer, because you have done one year of physics. So from four, you didn't do any physics. So it is important, Jeff, and for them it was important, but also as government, it was critical for us to churn out competent students, competent professionals in the future, who will not come and treat Jeff for what he is not sick about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, even as we move on on this, because um, across the region, um, when COVID struck, there was an East African uh, cooperation uh, type of strategy on how to deal with this moving forward yes. in various facets. Mm. Are there any learnings we have from our neighbors on how to deal with this? Because some of our neighbors opened school much earlier. Yeah. Uh, from there, mm -hmm. is there some sort of uh, learning that's taking place so that even as we get into this, mm -hmm. we've seen what has happened mm -hmm. in other countries around the mm -hmm. region mm -hmm. and we're preparing for that as well? Has that mm -hmm. uh, The truth is, eh? We are going to discuss this with an exception, but greatly respectful of Tanzania. Tanzania is not a benchmark, and we are not going to quote Tanzania because Tanzania locked any form of information, any form of comparative notes, any form of engagement from the world. So East Africa, EAC, can only discuss Rwanda, discuss Uganda, discuss South Sudan, discuss Burundi. And I want to begin there and say, there was an agreement within the EAC corporation to ensure that schools return as early as from July. Now, some countries brought their children back in August, others in September. Now, because of obligations, we also decided that Kenya must as well be seen to be cooperating because we are also held under the regime of EAC. And by comparing pros and cons, we decided whatever happens, the safety of our learners is supreme. That is why we said, in the interest of East African cooperation, and to be seen like we also part of it, let us return to school. But in phases, that is how we ended up returning examination class and transitional class, the grade four. Mm -hmm. So we also borrowed heavily, we also compared heavily with our brothers and sisters in East African region. And yes, through that comparative uh, advantage and engagement, we were able to bring back our children back to school. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions and comments coming in on uh, Twitter. You can get me at I am Jeff Mote on Twitter or at K24TV. Uh, my name's uh, Jeff CM, uh, saying, my friend Zach, uh, we're in the 21st century. I'm sure you're talking about um, how this worked uh, before. Uh, if Rwanda did all of those classes in a short time and Kenya had the experience having done this before, mm. what made it hard for them to do this during COVID? We should have been even further ahead. Mm. I answer him that the Rwanda has not done it in short time. It has done it over a long time, just as is Kenya. Again, we know that we had reduced income. If we were also to go overdrive by building classes, we are going to, to lose it. And, and, and physically, uh, be fair enough, Jeff, and I appreciate the question from my brother. Building classes is not the antidote of COVID-19 and pressure we are getting now. It was not, because even if we had classes, that means we also need teachers. Secondly, I have told you we have, we have places with classes. Majority of our places outside Nairobi have classes. So that is not the priority. If you are to hire, if rather you are to construct classes equivalent to what we need to counter social distance, it comes with other burdens. We need to employ teachers to handle it. We need to expand the staffing in, the, in schools. We need to uh, register more schools by putting more, uh, you know, policy, po at policy level, by putting more energy and resources towards acquiring this. The question is, is it viable? The answer is no. So the question is not to be compared with Rwanda. And please, Kenyan, Kenyans must move beyond Rwanda. Okay. Uh, because if they want a Rwanda that achieves 22,000 classes in the short time they think it is, if they want a Rwanda 
where a minister is jailed the evening he commits corruption, they must allow their form of governance in Kenya, which is absolute autocracy. Let me get Peter Noro in on this particular issue as well. Peter, uh, we've reestablished a connection right there, and if you can hear me, I want you to take off the CEO Kenya Private Schools Association hat and put on the parents' hat. Earlier in the show, we spoke to your son, Mark, um, on um, his excitement going back to school. But as a parent, what's your concern? How do you feel about this particular process as you send your son uh, back to school this year? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. I'm actually taking two of my children back to school. And uh, as a parent, I'm uh, expecting that uh, the schools where I take my children to school will have put in the necessary uh, protocols and the guidelines as given to them by the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health. Because that is critical for, 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 for all of us as parents, because the safety of our children is paramount and we can't compromise that for anything else. So I'm happy to, to note that uh, where I take my children to school, I've been uh, there and I've seen what they've been able to do. And I'm satisfied that this is uh, what they're expected actually to do. So I'm very confident, even as I take my children to school, that uh, they will be safe and that any issue that will be uh, emerging, they should be able to, to respond to it as soon as possible. But again, wearing uh, the hat of the Kenya Private Schools Association, I want to appreciate the fact that a majority of the private schools across the country have tried uh, with a lot of challenges to put in place all the necessary uh, uh, protocols in place and to also ensure that uh, our learners, our teachers and any other stakeholder accessing the school is safe as we reopen our schools. For us as Kenya Private Schools Association, we ensured that all our schools establish what we are calling the COVID-19 response committee that is school-based. And uh, within that, we have one lead teacher uh, who now oversees the whole process, and this has to be the head teacher, who oversees the processes to ensure that every protocol as given to us by the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education is adhered to at this point in time. It has been a challenge. And as we get back to school, there are quite a number of things that uh, we will also need to address as uh, private schools. But not just us, but also all of us, including public schools. The issue of continued communication to our stakeholders, that is our learners, our teachers, and, uh, uh, and uh, our parents, on what they need to observe as learning goes on in our institutions. Okay. Because at this point in time, we are using the experience of reopening grade four, class eight, and form four to now manage the entire school that we are now reopening from kindergarten through to form four. What is it that needs to be done? We have guided our children to ensure that when they come to school, they have masks. When they are in school, we have guided our teachers to ensure that the children are properly uh, trained uh, on how to wear the masks properly. We have ensured that Hand washing stations are available at very strategic, critical uh, points within the school with clean uh, running water and soap. And that the children are not just forced to wash hands, but they are encouraged on the need for them to wash hands so that they can be able to reduce uh, the issues of COVID-19. Okay, Peter. We are also asking, oh, Peter, are also asking our schools. Because of time, you might have to cut it short at that particular point in uh, time as far as this conversation is had. Uh, apologies for the technical hits right there because there was a lot you could have added, uh, added to the conversation, but we have to uh, wrap it up at this uh, particular point on this particular conversation. Of course, we'll have successive uh, discussions on this, even as you take the children back to school. Um, your assessment on that as well as a parent and, of course, as a CEO of the Kenya Private Schools Association. But that's where we draw the curtains on this, unfortunately, for now. Many thanks for making time, uh, Mr. Ndoro, uh, for being on the show even before you take your two children back to school. Asante Sana for making time. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and also in studio, Zach, I think you've heard it. He is mm. taking his children back to school. Uh, no need for government action. Thank okay, I'm very so happy. Now, now my, my, my heart is at peace. Thank you very uh, much. It. And you know, many schools are not opening today. Mm. Others have decided to open in phases, okay. which is also, also we are not opposed to it as government. Okay. Children should open, but it should be within this week. Okay. And those plans should be communicated to the parents clearly 
so that everybody is put back on track to school. That's Thank you mean. very much for this time, Jeff. Asante sana, Bwana uh, CES. I know there's and, a lot and of happy work new for year. you this week. And happy new year to you as well. Mm, All you. the best as you get our children uh, back to school. Thank of you. course, CES, uh, Zach Kenudia, he's uh, CES in the Ministry of Education. Also joined the conversation uh, virtually was uh, Peter Ndoro, the CEO of the Kenya Private Schools Association. That's why we take our first break right here on the show. We take a short break and after that, we get interactive on K24 this morning. Don't go too far.